When working with HDF5, the decision of how to chunk your data set is pretty important. Now you can let HDF5 automatically choose a chunk size, but that generally won't be optimal for the particular data, uh, data type of use that you're working with. If you know the patterns of how you're using the data and which axes and which dimensions you tend to be working with more often, then chunking along those spaces will significantly improve your overall I.O. and, and, and um, throughput speeds to it, writing and reading and writing from that, from that data set. Now, there's a number of variables to balance when trying to pick a chunk size. And so you have to strike the right balance between, between these various competing factors. There's, there's never a single best answer. It really depends on what your use case looks like. So on the one hand, you want to maximize your overall I.O., right? Meaning you want to read and write, you know, contiguous pieces as much as possible. The fewer chunks you have to cross when doing so, the faster your overall I.O. is going to be. Obviously, if you knew that you had a giant data set and you were going to read and write the entire thing once, then you wouldn't want to chunk at all. You would just read the entire thing and do something with it or write the entire data set and that would be it. And that would be the most efficient way if you knew that you just needed to read or write the entire thing. So making sure that you make your chunks big enough so that you're not constantly doing a lot of reads is important. Re uh, crossing a lot of chunk boundaries is important because there's a cost to changing every time, every changing over different different chunks every time. But at the same time, you also want to make sure that you minimize non-used data, meaning if all you need is one or two elements, one or two values out of your data set, and your chunk size is too big, then you have to read the entire chunk just to get that one or two values out of your data set. And similarly, if you need to update one or two values out of your data set, then you have to write the entire chunk out after reading it once first, updating a couple values, and then writing back the entire chunk. That can be really costly if the amount that you're reading and writing is significantly out of balance with the overall chunk size. So this is why, again, it's important to know what your overall use case is going to look like. Knowing how, what types of, how, how much of the data you're going to be accessing at a given time will significantly help understand what the right chunk size should be. And then there's the counterpoint. So you might say, well, if that's the case, well, why don't I just if I want to minimize the amount of non-used data I.O., then I should make my chunk sizes as small as possible. Because if I did that, then I would never have any wasted read or writes. I'd always be only reading you know, a single element out of, the, out of the data set, and that's one chunk, and so I'm good to go. Well, while that sounds appealing, there is, a, like I said before, a significant cost to reading or writing and finding and locating chunks. And so if your entire data set at the element level is just each individual chunk, you'll be spending an enormous amount of time just dealing with the overhead costs of reading or writing and finding all these chunks because it's this binary search tree, it's got an index, all that kind of stuff. So you have to make sure that you aren't spending too much time processing chunk boundaries. Otherwise, you're spending a lot of I.O. time uh, just parsing and making sense of where your chunks are. So you don't want to you don't want to have too fine a chunking set. You have to strike the right balance, and it's not always obvious how to do this. So let's think through it with an example or two. Let's pretend that you have a three-dimensional data set. So this three-dimensional data set, right, is looks oops looks something like this, right, and it's got three dimensions that you're playing with. Your chunk size that you specify has to span all of the dimensions. It has to be at least one element in every dimension. That's the minimum chunk size. So if this was you know, a data set that was 10,000 in this axis, and then 50 in this axis, and then 20 in this axis, then the minimum chunk size has to be one by one by one. But in general, you're probably not going to want to do that. You're going to want to instead do some other type of chunking. And what that larger chunking looks like really depends on what the use case is. So for something like this, where it's a lot taller right, in one dimension than it is the others, it's, it really 
is important to understand what these dimensions represent. This could very very similar, you know, very easily be a a data set for something that looks like a series of frames or images, where the pixel sizes themselves are 20 by 50. That you know, this represents a frame, and there's a thousand frames tiled across this way. So depending on the type of operations you're performing, it may be very useful to chunk in more, in, in dimensions that are larger in these two dimensions, right, 20 by 50, than in this dimension, around the, ten, around the 1,000. Maybe, right, time, if this is the time axis, is something that you would want to span occasionally, but not over long periods of time, meaning, if this was indeed a, a series of images and frames for video, then it's unlikely that you're going to want to pick out right these sets of pixels across the entire data set contiguously. That's less likely to happen than in an application where you are instead pulling out significant pieces of each frame and maybe you're doing so over a relatively small time period. So a chunk size in this case, you know, maybe around two or three frames, a chunk size in this case of 10 by 10 in this axis, right? So if this is axis one, two, three, a chunk size of, or a chunk shape of 10 by 20, well, I guess you can't do 20, maybe you do 25, because it has to be, this has to, this has to be even intervals or even multiples of the actual full, full range. 10 by 25 by, say, 5, could be an interesting and potentially very, very op, you know, optimal-ish chunk size for this type of usage. Why? Because unless you know you're going to be operating on the entire frame every single time, meaning all 20 by 50 pixels, it's probably nicer for you to break up the break up the, the, the image into smaller components. But maybe you do know that you're actually always going to need the entire frame's worth of data every single time, in which case you should simply chunk at 20 by 50 because you know you want the entire frame. You know, if you want one pixel, you're going to want all of the pixels in that frame by maybe here you do 5 or 10 or whatever you want this this longer axis to be. And that way you actually have a very, very efficient framework because you know what your usage case is going to look like. It's always going to use the full frame of data to do with the analysis. And so you're never going to not want all of the pixels of the data. But if you know that you might want regions of interest, then it may be useful to, to, to slice this up into something smaller. Maybe you go even smaller. Maybe you do 5 by 5 by 5. In terms of in terms of the pixel space, if you think that you know those edges are not something you're going to use very commonly, then that could help you really shave off you know some of this unused space. If you never if you know you're never going to read these these corner these corner uh, pixels, for example, that that would help you save a lot of space, a lot of I/O time. But let's say you had a different type of a different type of of you know use case. Let's say you had a two-dimensional data set. Where you had time on this axis, and you had you know different types of signals or features along this axis, and each of them is an independent measurement or feature or channel or whatever it may be. It's a multi-channel data where the biggest thing that's happening is you're sampling at some common frequency, right? And you're sampling all of your dimensions simultaneously. Well, what that looks like then is that you have a data set here that if this is that first dimension, it's got data along this dimension, and the next one has data along this dimension, and the next one has data along this dimension, right, and so on. And rarely are you ever going to need to access a short period of time across all of the data. Instead, if you know that your use case is primarily looking at any given feature across time, then you're going to want to set a chunk size that's one in this feature dimension, but it could be 10,000 or 50,000 
along the time dimension if you know your primary mode of access is striped across the time. And so this is just, again, knowing what your application looks like. And once you know how you, once you can think through how you might want to be reading and writing data from your data set, then you can set the appropriate chunk size to do that. It, it makes a reasonably significant impact on, on the actual throughput of your data set. And the wrong chunk size can be devastating for your, for your I.O. Just imagine you chose a, throughput, uh, a, disk, uh, a chunk size that's like this for this data set. And then what you're going to do is, let's say you're going to try to low pass filter the data for a single given channel. So what then you're going to do is you're going to take this blue, this blue trace and over this channel you want to low pass filter the data along this dimension. That means you have to open every single chunk on every single other channel and read from all of that just to get the one little piece of, of dimensional feature data that you wanted here. That's highly inefficient. It's reading many, many, many more times the amount of data than you actually want. So if your use case is not dealing with that type of that type of direct that type of um, operation, meaning you're not taking windows across the entire feature space for for blocks of time, then you probably don't want to shape the data that way. And for many things that are sampled in time series data like this, it's actually very common that you're going to want to you're going to want to shape your data set, your, your chunk size, your chunk shape along this dimension. Now, it could be, it could even just be a little oblong. It doesn't have to be huge. Let's see if, it's, if you're sampling something at, you know, at 100 hertz, then you might simply say, I want my chunks to be 100 by 1 because I want, you know, one second worth of data along that direction. And that would still get you a significant amount of efficiency. And again, because you're not, you know that you would rarely pull data across the time. But if you do, it also wouldn't cost you that much. Because if you're trying to actually look at any window of time at something that's 100 hertz, for example, then you're probably not going to be too devastated if you have to read an entire second's worth of data, especially if this recording is, you know, hours or days long. It's not that big of a deal to pay. So thinking about the use case here is, is often very helpful. And that's, that's one of the critical aspects about picking chunk shapes. Getting, getting the use case right is everything. Think through it, map out what that should look like, and think about what, you're, what, how, what, you're, what your application and how you're going to be accessing your data, and pick a, a chunk size that looks reasonable. And if you're not sure, pick something, try a couple different parameters, version, version, different shapes, see what your data, data usage looks like, see what your execution times look like. And if you're not happy with them, or you think you might be picking something that's not optimal, try a slightly different chunk shape and perform the same operations and see if you're seeing significant differences. If the times don't change, then the types of computations you're performing aren't particularly sensitive to the various chunk shapes you might be thinking about. But if they are very sensitive and you're seeing widely disparate changes in your, in your, in your execution times, then it might be worth spending a little bit of time to optimize what the right chunk shape is so that you can pay off that dividend in subsequent analyses and time savings. There's no right answer. It really comes down to what is your computational use case and what, what type of operation are you trying to perform. But it is a parameter that you have a significant amount of control over, and so it's worth thinking about.